A pretty good case can be made that the most valuable thing that you own are your eyeballs. In fact, just this past year, just 10 companies in our country spent a cumulative total of $600 million for your eyeballs. More specifically, they were paying all of that money for your attention. Those were dollars that they spent advertising on Facebook. Why? Because they are convinced that Facebook can get and keep your eyeballs and therefore Facebook is the perfect place for them to put their ads. Recently, through movies like The Social Dilemma on Netflix, more and more people are becoming aware of the economic engine that drives our social media platforms. I'm certainly not interested in, in adding my voice to all of those who are sounding the alarm about the things that those social media platforms are willing and able to do to keep our attention. What I am interested in doing, however, is telling you that Jesus is also of the opinion that perhaps the most valuable thing that you own are your eyeballs. Listen to what Jesus once said. He said, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. So normally we think of our eyes primarily as input organs. Our eyes are the way that everything in the world around us gets in to our mind and to our heart. Our eyes are the window to our soul, as the saying goes. And all of that is, is true, and that alone is reason enough to be very careful about what we are looking at. But in these verses, Jesus is saying just the opposite. Not just that our eyes are input organs, but that they're actually output organs. That our eyes are not just the window that lets what is on the outside in, they're also like a lamp for our soul that lets what is inside get out. In fact, picture your eyes as if they were two high-powered flashlights or even two high-powered laser pointers. Your eyes light up and point out what is most important to you, what your mind is thinking about the most, what your heart is desiring the most. And Jesus says in these verses that if our eyes are healthy, it's a sign that our whole body, our whole soul, our whole mind and heart are full of light. In other words, if we are paying attention to healthy, important, godly things, it's an indication that our hearts can be described in just the same way. Of course, the opposite is true as well. If our eyes are focused on unhealthy, unimportant, ungodly things, then the same is true of our mind and our heart as well. $600 million probably sounds like a, a lot of money for someone to pay for your eyeballs. And yet, believe it or not, there's an even steeper price for us to pay if we are paying attention to all the wrong things. That's why this week I, I want to talk to you about what it means to live a life that is in focus, with more and more things and more and more people vying for and even paying millions of dollars for our attention. It's more important than ever to make sure that our eyes are focused on just the right thing. And thankfully, we're going to see this week that in order to spare us from having to pay that price of a life lived out of focus, Jesus was willing to pay the ultimate price to make sure that he has our undivided attention. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, fill our hearts and minds so full of the light of your truth and the light of your love that our eyes are naturally drawn to you. In your name we pray, amen. Recently, I heard a statistic that 70% of the videos that are viewed on YouTube come from YouTube's suggestions. In other words, it's not the video that you go to YouTube to see, it's the video that YouTube suggests when that one is over. And the one after that, and the one after that. Sometimes getting caught up in that endless cycle of watching one suggested video after another is described as falling down a rabbit hole. And even if that's never happened to you on YouTube, perhaps on, on some other platform or website, you've started scrolling and clicking and swiping and tapping, and suddenly two hours later, you kind of snap to and wonder how you got there. 
This week we're talking about what it means to live a life that is in focus, where our attention is directed at the most important and the best things in our lives. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I can sort of snap to out of the daily grind of life and realize that my life has gotten out of focus. And I don't know about you, but when that happens, very often I I wonder to myself, how did I get here? I mean, I don't know of anyone that actually sits down and says to themselves, I'm going to allow my life to get out of focus. I'm going to have upside down priorities. I'm going to chase after unimportant things and I am going to neglect the things that matter most. And yet, in spite of our best efforts, it it happens, doesn't it? We, We fall down those proverbial rabbit holes. Our life gets out of focus all the time. Well, thankfully, the Bible tells us why. The Bible tells us what's at the bottom of those rabbit holes. In other words, when we get distracted, the Bible helps us understand what it is that we have started chasing after. What is it? Well, to get an answer, I want to direct your attention to the example of someone in the Bible who had a tremendous amount of focus. His name was Paul. In the Bible, Paul actually talks about the the focus that he had. He talks about how he worked harder and studied harder than any of his peers. He talks about how he, he met every standard and even exceeded every expectation for someone in his shoes. And Paul talks about what he was chasing after with all of that focus He was chasing after something he calls righteousness. In the Bible, righteousness is most specifically a term that's used in the context of a courtroom setting. Righteousness is the verdict that a judge would give in a courtroom to someone who is innocent. More broadly, we could say that righteousness is approval. It's the assessment that someone is worthy, that they are acceptable, that they are enough. And really that approval, that assessment, is something that we're all after. In fact, righteousness is sort of fundamental to who we are as human beings, which means that that anytime we are chasing after something, even every time we are focused on, on getting something, that's what we're after. That's what is at the bottom of that rabbit hole. We're convinced that that thing can deliver to us our righteousness. Thankfully, the Bible also tells us that we don't have to fall down those rabbit holes. And that's what Paul found out the day he met Jesus. When Paul met Jesus, he realized that that righteousness he was after was not something that he needed to earn. Instead, it was a free gift because of everything that Jesus had done. And when Paul realized that, his focus suddenly changed. All of those things that he was chasing after and working so hard for, well, here's what Paul says. He says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Yes, life is full of all kinds of rabbit holes, but thankfully, if our focus is on Jesus, we don't have to fall down those rabbit holes to find the righteousness we are after. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for giving us the righteousness we need but could never possibly earn. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we always find our righteousness in you. Amen. You've probably heard by now that multitasking is a myth. Years ago, it seemed that multitasking was this ability that everyone craved that was was highly valued for only highly skilled people. But these days, it seems as though the consensus is that multitasking doesn't actually work. That if you try and focus on even two separate things at the same time, you end up not doing either one very well. This week, we're talking about living a life that is in focus, and specifically that our focus, our attention, is naturally drawn to things that we think can deliver to us righteousness, that that approval, that assessment of worth that we crave. And today I want to emphasize that what is true of our work is also true of our righteousness, namely that we are not very good at multitasking. Inevitably, we're going to be looking for our righteousness from one primary source. Speaking of work, work is one of those things that can cause us to easily get distracted. It's so very easy for us to think of who we are in terms of what we do. 
Maybe that's the specific type of work that we do, how noble it is, how essential it is to society. Maybe it's the specific job title that we hold, what's written on our, our business card or on the door out in front of our office. Maybe it's the salary that we have and the lifestyle that that salary allows us to enjoy. It's so very easy for us to find our worth in our work. Only problem is, it doesn't actually work. And if anyone could tell us that, it was probably King Solomon. King Solomon lived 900 years before Jesus was born. And from what we know from the Bible, King Solomon was a busy guy. In fact, in the Bible, King Solomon talks about some of the things that he accomplished in his life, how he built houses and, and parks and gardens and reservoirs. He accumulated massive amounts of sheep and cattle and silver and gold. And yet when King Solomon looked back at his life, he realized that everything that he had accomplished, everything he had accumulated, was just going to be left behind the moment he died. And so here's what King Solomon said. When I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Our work cannot be the source of our righteousness and therefore our work should not be the focus of our lives. And thankfully it doesn't have to be. It's actually Jesus' work that he did in our place that gives us the righteousness and the approval we crave. Because of Jesus, we actually get to take our name and put it right at the top of his resume as if it were our own. We get to look at his business card where he's identified as a child of God, in fact, as God's pride and joy, and we get to claim that status as our own. We get to look at all of God's heavenly riches and know with absolute confidence that those riches are our eternal inheritance. And that's why Jesus can say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Why? So that I can give you more work? No, Jesus says, so that I can give you rest. Work can't deliver our righteousness. It can't be the focus of our lives. And while it may be true that we as human beings are, are not very good at multitasking, do you know what we are really good at? We're really good at seeing things out of the corners of our eyes. In fact, for a healthy human eye, our peripheral vision can actually extend up to 110 degrees in either direction. What that means is that while you might not have eyes in the back of your head, your peripheral vision does allow you to see things that are, are literally behind you. That's another blessing of having a life that is in focus. Even if our eyes are directed solely and squarely on the most important things, solely and squarely on Jesus, we have lots of room in our peripheral vision for lots of other wonderful blessings from God, including our work. No, our work can't be the meaning of our lives, but our work can certainly be a blessing in our lives. Our work helps us provide for the things that we need for our daily life. Our work gives us joy and satisfaction as we take the gifts that God has given us and we put them to use for the benefit of others. And in fact, that's exactly what wise King Solomon realized. He said, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. So here's what wise King Solomon figured out. That when our focus is where it should be, when our focus is on Jesus, it helps us see everything else in life much better too. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the opportunities you give us to work and the gifts you've given us to do it. Keep us from finding our sense of worth in our work. Instead, give us the rest that your work provides. Amen. You've maybe heard it said that children don't come with an instruction manual. Don't believe it for a second. From books to blogs to podcasts to social media groups, advice about parenting is everywhere these days. At first, it's about whether to nurse or, or give the child formula, about whether to use cloth diapers or disposables. 
Then a little bit later, it's about social development and, and literacy and kindergarten readiness. Then later on, it's about when you should let them have their very first phone or let them go out on their very first date. And of course, all of that advice can be good. And yet, because we are so inundated by it, it's easy for us to lose focus. This week, we're talking about a life that is lived in focus, and we've seen how our focus, our attention, is naturally drawn to whatever we are convinced can deliver to us righteousness, that, that sense of approval and worthiness that we all crave. And perhaps one of the things that can most easily cause us to lose focus is parenting. Right now, all three of my kids are at a stage in life where the opportunities for them to be involved in different activities are almost endless. From sports to music to theater, the activities are almost limitless. And there is something that, that stresses me out way more than it ever should. It's every single time I get one more email about one more camp, one more class, one more lesson, one more league, one more tournament, one more team. Why do I feel almost obligated to say yes to each and every one of those things, regardless of whether or not I have the time or the money that they demand? Is it because my kids are just dying to have their schedule so jam-packed with every activity under the sun? Probably not. Is it because all of those activities are going to make a, a long-term and life-changing difference in their lives? Probably not. It's because my ability to make those opportunities available to my children, it, it's very natural for me to view that as a reflection on myself as a parent. So often the decisions that we make as parents are not so much about what those decisions will do to our children, but what they will say about us. It's very easy for us to look to our parenting as the source of our righteousness. And if ever there was someone who was tempted for that to be the case, it was probably Abraham. If you know anything about Abraham, you maybe know that almost his entire life was sort of defined by waiting to become a parent. Abraham had to wait 25 years for God to keep the promise that he had made that he would bless he and his wife Sarah with a son. And after all of that waiting, when God finally gave Abraham his son Isaac, do you know what God did? He told Abraham to kill him. God's command that Abraham would sacrifice his son Isaac was really a test of Abraham's focus. It was a test to see if Abraham still loved God even more than he loved his son. Now, we might sit here and sort of be tempted to wonder how God could possibly ask a father to do something so cruel and so mean to his one and only son. And yet, believe it or not, if Abraham loved Isaac more than he loved God, God would have actually been doing Isaac a favor. Children cannot be the source of righteousness or approval for their parents. In fact, that burden is so heavy that it will absolutely crush any child. Well, you maybe know how the story comes to an end. God spared the life of Abraham's son Isaac. God provided a ram as a substitute sacrifice that Abraham could offer. And in that story, that, that ram actually symbolizes why our parenting doesn't need to be the source of our righteousness. That ram actually symbolizes Jesus, who God gave as a substitute sacrifice for all of us. Here's what the Bible says in the book of Romans. It says, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So in God, we have a father who loves us so much that he was willing to give up his own son as a sacrifice for us all. Which means that we certainly don't need to earn our father's approval by anything that we do, certainly not by being perfect mothers and fathers ourselves. Our parenting can't be the source of our righteousness, which means that our parenting shouldn't be the focus of our lives. But as we saw yesterday, when our focus is in the right place, when it's on Jesus, there is lots of room in our peripheral vision, including for our parenting. When our focus is on Jesus, we will see our role as parents much more clearly. We will see our children as blessings from God, blessings that, that don't bring us the approval that we need, but blessings that we can bring 
the approval that God has for them in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the gift of our children and the privilege of being parents. Give us focus and perseverance as we seek to direct the eyes of our children to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Three out of the top five Google searches during the year 2020 were related to the topic that you'd sort of expect. 2020 was defined by a global pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in more than a century. And so you'd expect people to be Googling about it. And sure enough, they were three of the top five spots during the past year, but not number one. Instead, that number one spot was reserved for something that happens on schedule, as expected, every four years, the 2020 election. If that's any indication, it sure shows how important politics have become to so many people. This week, we've been talking about a, a life that is in focus, and we've seen again and again how our focus is naturally drawn to whatever it is we think can deliver to us righteousness, that sense of approval, that assessment of worthiness that we all crave. And if Google is any indication, then a lot of people put a lot of focus into politics, which means that a lot of people are looking for their righteousness in politics. That includes a lot of Christian people who sometimes speculate about what sort of political positions Jesus might hold if he were alive today. Well, we actually do know one very political thing that Jesus actually said. One time when he was asked about paying taxes, Jesus said this, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. I think most of the time when that passage is talked about, the focus is on making sure that we give to Caesar everything that is rightfully his. The Bible says that we should obey our government. The Bible says that we should respect our government. We should pray for our government. And yes, we should pay our taxes to our government. God wants us to give to Caesar everything that is rightfully his. And yet, perhaps now more than ever, the greater temptation is not to give to Caesar too little, but to actually give to Caesar too much. Not to withhold from Caesar something that is rightfully his, but to, to actually hand over to Caesar something that is rightfully God's. And that includes making Caesar the source of our righteousness. It is easier now than ever to not just take, but even publicize our political stances. And so doing so becomes a very easy way for us to seek the approval that we so desperately crave. It is easy for us to look to our politics as the source of our righteousness. And it doesn't even matter what the issue might be. It might be standing up for the Bible's view on marriage. It might be speaking up for the lives of the unborn or standing up for our religious liberty. It might be taking care of the environment, trying to make sure that everyone has access to affordable health care or speaking up for the rights of the marginalized and the vulnerable. Those probably seem like they fall into two very opposite ends of the political spectrum. And yet all of those are, are good causes that Christians can work for and Christians can vote for. But none of those things is able to be the source of our righteousness. And thankfully, none of them has to be. You know, out of all the things that would have maybe tempted Jesus to lose focus during his time here on earth, I wonder if politics was kind of right at the top of the list. When Jesus was healing and feeding the masses, his own people wanted to make him a king, and yet he refused. When Jesus was standing in front of Pontius Pilate, he had the perfect opportunity for a power grab. And yet, instead of being distracted by the earthly kingdom he could have established or, or the military coup that he could have led, Jesus instead remained focused on the cross that he came to make his throne. And because he did, our righteousness, our approval is secure. Our politics can't be the source of that righteousness, and so our politics can't be the focus of our lives. Instead, politics can stay where all good gifts from God belong, in our peripheral vision. We can work for 
and we can vote for noble causes like standing up for the, the lives of the unborn, standing up for the rights of the vulnerable and the oppressed. And, and we can do all of that, not as a way to earn the approval that we crave from God, but as people who already know that that approval is theirs. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for keeping your focus on the heavenly kingdom you came to establish. Keep our eyes firmly fixed on that kingdom and your righteousness that we may freely and joyfully serve those around us. Amen.